Okay, thank you, Barry, and hello to everybody. Um, so yeah, tonight's talk is on radar identification. Normally, um, this this was this was put together this talk actually to go with one of the Hoss workshops. So normally, the uh, process would be that we would do this talk and then go and spend a couple of hours in the field looking at waders and, and putting everything we've we've discussed into practice um but given given the situation at the moment that's difficult to achieve so i think this format comes across okay um as just just a talk um i've adapted it slightly um but right we'll we'll just just run through uh, i'm conscious that i've got an hour and i tend to always overrun in these things so i'll try not to dally too much um um what we're going to look at tonight is just focusing on, on Hampshire waders. Um, so we're not going to get bogged down in, in a whole raft of different species, just the ones that we're likely to see on a day out in Hampshire. Um, first of all, we'll look at families, um, then we'll focus on common species. Um, it's good, I think, in identification of any, any family or group of birds that you're, you're looking to get um, uh, better on is to focus on the common species, um, get to know them inside and out, and then if you have something unusual turn up, um, it's, it stands out from the crowd and you can hone in on that and focus on that and not worry about the other stuff. Um, we'll also look at separating confusion species, so there's those classic ones like black-tailed and bar-tailed godwit or spotted and common red shank. Uh, we'll look a bit about wader ecology in Hampshire, uh, migration, where our waders come from, and a little bit about colouring waders because we have quite a few knocking around on our coast. Um, normally, uh, with, a, with an interactive audience, I would say, what are these at the bottom? But it's kind of difficult to do in this, in this environment. So I'll just say that at the bottom of the page here, we've got a flock of wimbrel passing through on the coast, um, which are a classic, um, classic one that can create a bit of a conundrum when you're looking, looking at them. Um, here, we'd, we'd identify these as, as wimbrel um, based on their size, of course, that's something in a photograph like this you can't really judge. Um, but uh, Wimbrel are smaller birds, smaller than curlew, um, which is the other similar species. Um, and on their bill, uh, they have a shorter, um, sort of chunkier bill. Um, but the key thing that you, you, you can never pick up on a photograph is their call. Cool. Um, so we'll look at we'll look at all this kind of detail further on in the talk. We we'll focus on Wimbrel. So. Waders in Hampshire. Um, we've got 29 regular species that occur, um, 10 of which breed in Hampshire, 23 species winter in Hampshire. Um, we have six regular species that pass through Hampshire on migration, Wimbrel being one of those. Um, and then we have regular rarities as well, uh, which add, add to the numbers. Um, but as I'll say all the way through this is just not to get hung up on rarities um, too much. Um, it's always best to, to consider everything to be a common species until you've ruled out everything else and you can start maybe thinking about that the bird you're looking at might be some sort of rarity. Um, just to put it in context, I've, I've been birding my local patch at Livington Keyhaven marshes for night on 20 years, um, ranging any, anything from, from every day of the week to at the least four or five days a week. Um, and over that time I've found maybe if I'm lucky, one one rare wader a year. So, I mean, the chances of coming across one are, are really very slim. Um, so, waders can occur anywhere in the county, uh, coast, lakes, river valleys, farmlands, downland and heathland. So you don't, the point of that is to say that you don't just have to be at the coast to encounter uh, waders. Um, they can turn up anywhere at pretty much any time of the year. Um, of course, you get different species occurring in different habitats. And they're present year round. Uh, we're lucky in this part of the world we have nationally significant breeding populations of some species and also internationally important wintering numbers, particularly in the Solent. Um, so we're, we're blessed where we are in Hampshire. So identifying waders in the field, sort of the key, the key to, oh sorry, I'm skipping, I should go back to that. That's that bird there, in case anybody was wondering, is a curly sandpiper. Um, that's in um, it's an adult uh, that's molting from its um, uh, summer plumage into wintering plumage. This, it always helps to know when, when the image was taken. So this was taken in August um, at the coast. Um, but it's a plumage you don't often see in curly sandpiper. Um, so that's often quite a good trick question, that one. Um, so identifying waders in the field. Um, some of the keys uh, sort of to familiarise yourself with family groups. We'll look at those in just a second. Um, 
and as I said before, get to know the common species very well. Um, we have a number of common species like Dunlin and Redshank, uh, Blacktail Godwit and Curly. Get to know those inside and out, and that always helps uh, when you have something uh, less common turn up. Then the calls and the habits um, are key. Um, so uh, in particular in the habits, um, get to know which birds, you know, use which habitats at, at what time always helps in identification. Um, consider the environment the bird is in. Um, as I say, you get, get freshwater specialists, saltwater specialists, rocky, rocky shoreline, sandy shoreline specialists. Um, as I said before, rare, rare waders are exactly that. Rule out the common stuff first. And the main thing is spending time in the field observing common species. So a big part of identification, I think, you know, you've got different tiers. You've got looking at the bird, you've got the plumage and, and what it looks like is, is one thing. Um, hearing it is another. Um, so what it's called is like. Also where it is, the environment that it's in. But another big part of it is, is what we call jizz, which is general impression, size and shape. And so it's just like the feel of the bird. So here we've got uh, at the bottom of the picture some knot, which, are, which can be difficult to identify. These ones are in summer plumage. The knot are just, just sort of dumpy, small waders. They're quite, quite distinctive just by the general shape of them. And so it's a good thing just, to, just by observing birds a lot in the field, particularly waders, it, you get a feel for how they, how they behave, how they move um, and their shape and form. Okay, so we'll look at, we'll look at families um, to start with. Um, so starting here, we've got uh, the plover family. Um, sort of as an aside, when, when you're looking at, at waders, such as these plovers here, you can get a feel for, for how they live their life a bit by looking at the size and the shape of the bird, and in, in particular the bill. So here, uh, the plover family, uh, all, the, all of the members of the family have short bills um, which tells you that they, they're not feeding, they're not um, uh, drilling into the, in, into the substrate to look for invertebrates, they're surface feeders. Um, and add to that, in, in particular species like um, grey plover, golden plover and lapwing, they have relatively big eyes, so it shows that they're, they're visually looking for, for their food. So, I mean, we won't focus on the individuals here through this section so much, we'll look at those a bit later on in the talk, but just in general, um, one of the first steps when you're out looking, looking at a bird, um, a wading bird, say offshore or, or wherever you happen to be, um, the first step in identifying it is getting, trying to understand what family it is. Um, and so here with the plover family, there's a lot of similarities. They're all um, quite short necked, plump um, birds, short beaked. Um, they range in sizes, but the overall feel for all of them, they're quite uniform in, in, in their family group. Um, their feeding action, uh, because they're surface feeders, is, is they feed with their eyes. So they, 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 they look and they listen for their invertebrate prey. Um, so typically they, they will stand still looking and listening and then run on maybe two or three meters and stop again, and look and listen, maybe pick at a morsel of food. And that's sort of typical behavior for all the members of the family. So next, we've got the Tringa sandpipers, um, which are um, medium-sized waders. Um, they're all pretty much coastal species, um, long-billed, long-legged, uh, almost your, your sort of stereotypical wading bird. Um, the common red shank and the spotted red shank are the only two species with, with, with proper red legs. Um, a bit turnstone have orangey legs, mostly rough, but um, yeah, they're, they're the only two um, um, sort of mid-sized waders um, for that appearance. Um, they're all um, fairly long-legged, which tells you that they, they're, gonna, they could, they're happy feeding in water. Uh, they're long-beaked, um, so they're going to be um, uh, drilling down to, to look for invertebrates in soft mud. Um, they frequently also feed around the edge of pools and, and the margin of the intertidal. Um, they're all, all very vocal. Um, and fairly uniform in size and, and general shape and appearance. Um, next is probably the most challenging family is the Calidris sandpipers or as the Americans call them peeps which are our small medium-sized sandpipers um, most of which are fairly social they generally form flocks um, again they're all coastal species um, some have specialities 
um, such as the purple sandpiper um, feeds on rocky shorelines. The sandling uh, feeds on um, shingle beaches and sandy beaches running along the shoreline. Um, and then the, the dunlin and the knots that we'll focus on again a bit later on are birds of the intertidal area, but they're all very much coastal species. They're, they're birds that you would very rarely find inland. Uh, next up we have the snipe family, um, which are all uh, very well camouflaged, cryptic looking birds. Um, uh, the woodcock is fairly unique, focusing on that first of all, as that's a, a, a nocturnal bird that, that uh, are, is sort of arboreal and um, would roost and breed in woodland areas and come out at night to feed in paddocks and open areas where it probes. Uh, for earthworms or, or um, looks in dung for larvae and so on. Um, whereas the jacksnipe and the snipe are also largely nocturnal, um, very cryptic, very skulky, very difficult to find. Um, the snipe is the one that we're most likely to see uh, in any circumstance generally at the coast, but it can also be found very much inland in any wet boggy areas that are fairly undisturbed. Um, they're all birds that as you're walking along uh, if a bird flashes out from underneath your feet depending where you are it's most likely to be a member of this family if you're inland. Um, so woodcock in woodland, snipe out in a, in a marshy boggy area particularly like in the new forest or an area of wet heathland um, or at the coast. Um, jack snipe will also flash out from underneath your feet but they hold on very tight um, you have to be pretty much standing on top of one before it, it flies away. Um, jack snipe are the scarcest of the three um, although we think they're far more common than the records and observations that we have suggest. Um, it's a blessing this new technology in thermal imaging that's opening up a whole new world um, for these species where you can go out at night and by day using a thermal imaging camera and we're finding far more of particularly jack snipe and snipe than our records suggest um, are there. But they're difficult birds to observe um, and like I say um, your best chance of seeing a bird like a snipe or a jack snipe is on a calm winter's day when the sun's out. Um, they, they all like the sun um, as, as most birds do. Um, so if you scan along the edge of a reed bed or, or um, the edge of um, uh, a sort of a brackish lagoon you might be fortunate enough to see one out in the open sunning itself. Um, yes, all wonderful birds. Um, and then that takes us on to the large waders. Um, so that gives us black tailed godwit, bar tailed godwit, curly and wimbrel. So these are the large, long legged, long beaked um, birds that specialize in, in probing um, in muddy areas, uh, either offshore or in wet fields. Um, they're just as happy um, either side of the seawall, um, except that is bar tailed godwit, which is more of a coastal species. Um, uh, out of all these, just the curly is the only one that breeds in this country. We have about 40 odd pairs in the new forest. Um, but we'll focus on the identification of all of these a bit later on in the talk. Um, and then we have the other randoms, um, the sort of standalones. Um, so starting from the top left here, we have turnstone, um, which is a very charismatic species that um, is, is with us from August through till May. Um, very tame and bold species that can be found uh, along the coast. It's very much a coastal species that would be feeding, um, say for example, along a sea wall. Um, they feed along beaches as well, as the name suggests, turning stones to look underneath, looking for invertebrates or turning little clumps of seaweed. Um, they're fantastic birds, full of character. Um, so great just to sit and watch for, an, for a half an hour or an hour. They give you loads of entertainment as they bicker with one another. Um, they're Quite distinctive. Uh, this one here is um, is, is molting is, is into its winter plumage. Uh, when they fly, they're very stripy. Um, so a bit like looking to the right, the oyster catcher with the bold white wing bars. Turnstones also have bold white wing bars. So if you have a small a small wader uh, along along a sea wall that ta has taken flight, um, if it looks quite stripy with a big bold white wing bar and uh, white lines down its back, it's that's almost certainly going to be a turnstone. They never fly very far. They congregate in small groups of maybe anything between say five and, and 25 or 30. Uh, never massive flocks um, and like I say they're quite quite bold. 
Uh, going on next to oyster catcher, uh, which is a resident species that's present year round, uh, very distinctive. I, I would think most, most bird watchers are, are comfortable with, with identification of oyster catcher. So we won't focus on, on these and anywhere else in the talk. Um, but yeah, oyster catcher is your, is your classic bird of the coast. You also do get them inland occasionally. Um, distinctive by its massive carrot-like uh, bill um, and black and white plumage. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Avocet, another species that, that we're lucky to, to have breeding here and is presently around uh, along the coast. Again, another very distinctive species, uh, black and white. It's, it's our only wader with an upcurved beak. Um, if you're looking at a flock of Avocets, it's worth having a look at their beaks because you can sex them uh, from the beaks, um, uh, depending on the, on the length of the turn um, and how, how sharp the beak turns up, you can differentiate between the males and the females. Um, but yeah, a fantastic charismatic species. Um, it's another one that's wonderful to watch. And then in the bottom right corner, we have Ruff. Um, so Ruff is probably one of the more challenging waders that we get. They're, they're quite a scarce bird these days, uh, very much a coastal species again, um, a bird that would almost always be found inside the seawall. Uh, very rarely would you see one offshore. So they're, they're birds that are associated with marshy, freshwater marshes um, in coastal areas um, or brackish, brackish areas. Um, uh, the males are very distinctive. It's the, the, the white bird on the right is a male. Um, so that's quite distinctive and fairly straightforward. The challenge, challenging ones are the juveniles, which is the bird on the left. Um, so this, um, they can easily be confused with other species such as maybe um, red shank. But the thing is to look at here is you can see that it's, it's sort of overall, uh, it has, um, has a dark beak, um, which if you were looking at a red shank, um, would have a red base to the beak. Um, and the back has almost like a scaly appearance because of the fringes of its feathers are paler. Um, which again is a distinctive feature that you wouldn't you wouldn't have in other waders of that same size. So rough, a sort of red shank sort of sized birds. Um, yeah. And then moving on, we have our con common passage migrants. I'll whiz through these quite quickly because we're going to focus on all of these a bit later on in the talk. But these are birds that are that pass through generally pass through Hampshire on passage. One or two will stay to winter. So the common sandpiper and the green sandpiper, we do get small numbers wintering. Uh, gravel pits and, and um, um, common sandpipers along uh, rivers um, are fairly undisturbed. Um, I guess the stars amongst the uh, amongst the crop here are species like little stints and curly sandpiper that people like to look out for in the autumn as they move through, um, as they pass through sort of August, September, October sort of time, along with wood sandpiper, which is much scarcer. But these are all very similar looking, so we'll focus on these at the when we look at individual identification a bit further on in the talk. So the next step is, is getting to know our common birds. So I've picked out four or five common wading species that we can look at in detail. And these are all ones that I would recommend if you're out at the coast, just, just to watch for a while and, and just get to know them as, as well as you can. Um, so we're going to start with Dunlin. Dunlin is probably our most numerous wader that we get um, at the coast. Um, this weekend just gone, I did the, we had the monthly webs count and I counted Normandy Lagoon and I had just over 1,500 Dunlin on Normandy Lagoon um, itself, um, which was a challenge to count in itself, but they are a numerous, a numerous uh, species. Um, and it's inevitable when you have such a large number of birds, there's going to be some slight variation within, within individuals. But in general, with Dunlin, what you're looking at is a small, a very small wader, um, size of a starling, or even a bit smaller than a starling, really, sort of between a, between a starling and a large finch. Um, they all have a, a large, um, sorry, they all have a dark bill, um, which, which can be quite variable in length. Um, they're slightly decurved. Um, you rarely get them very short, but sometimes you get some individuals with longer beaks, um, which are from um, some um, other races passing through. But in general, the features that you're looking for, I mean, it's, with, with a species like Dunlin, it is, can be quite difficult because they, you know, if we're being honest with ourselves, they are quite drab and, and dull. Uh, they're fantastic birds to watch and entertain us, but um, they don't have that many distinguishing features. 
And the main thing you're looking for is, um, like I say, you're looking at the size. Um, when they're in flight, uh, you can look out for, um, on their top side, they have a very small white wing bar. Um, so if you're looking at a flock of small waders, um, Bunlins are the only ones, as you can see in that picture in the top left corner, that has quite a thin white wing bar. Other similar species like um, Sanderling, they have a very broad wing bar. Or another similar species like Curly Sandpiper, they have a white rump. Um, so you're looking for when they're in flight, that dark upper colour with a small white wing bar. Um, they form large flocks. Um, they can be, as I say, quite variable in size and tone. Um, they're present in Hampshire generally from August through till May with peak numbers uh, through the peak winter months, uh, a lot of it depending on local conditions. But they will flock with other similar sized waders. So if you have a flock of Dunlin, it's worth having a good look through them because they you could often find um, knot or sandaling, um, uh, if you're lucky, maybe something like a curly sandpiper in, in with the flock. Um, they also frequently flock with ringed plover. So ringed plover are a similar sized bird, but look, look very much different. Um, so ringed plover are very sort of um, black and white with a short beak. And obviously, as we said before, the plovers are quite small and dump and squat birds compared to a dunling. Um, something to look out for in the breeding season, they develop uh, breeding plumage, which includes this, this big black uh, patch on their belly, which is quite distinctive. Um, and when birds first return after breeding um, in August and September, they often arrive still either with the black, black patch complete or molting out of it. Um, so that's a very distinctive feature early in the season. Um, can also be quite confusing at times. Um, Dunlin um, prefer to feed offshore, um, so they'll feed on the intertidal, but they will also uh, hop over the seawall and they'll happily feed around saline lagoons. Um, they're like, um, <laughs> um, they, they work in, in very high speed. They're constantly in motion. If you watch a flock, even a roosting flock is almost constantly in motion and they're constantly um, babbling to one another. Um, but they're frequently, if you watch them, they're constantly drilling the ground looking for invertebrates in, um, in the substrate. Um, so that's, that's done then. Um, like I say, a fairly nondescript bird, but a, a good bird to get to know really well if you're at the coast. Um, the second bird to get to know really well is the common red shank, which is another very common species at the coast. You occasionally get them inland. Um, we have one or two pairs breeding in the New Forest, we have a few pairs breeding up in the Avon Valley um, and they could, there's always a chance one could turn up inland at a gravel pit or on a lake. Um, so they're a medium sized wader, so uh, they're considerably bigger than a Dunlin that we we're just looking at. Um, they're very vocal, um, they're often quite flighty. Um, they're known as the guardian of the marsh for that reason. If there's, if there's a sparrowhawk or a peregrine or whatever it might be around there, red shanks are normally amongst the first birds to flash and, and make quite a racket. Um, they're quite happy arguing amongst themselves as well, uh, generally. So they do make a, quite a lot of noise. Um, they will form flocks. Um, so on that same web count that I mentioned, um, on Normandy Lagoon, we had about 200 red shanks. So they'll happily flock together when they're roosting over high tide, um, but generally they like to feed singly. Um, but you could get a, a large group of birds uh, feeding on an intertidal area. Um, some can get quite ter territorial over their feeding grounds, um, which can cause to quite a few um, bickering incidents. Um, but the main things to look for, for with red shanks, the first thing is to identify it as, as a red shank. So you're looking for the red legs. Um, so that will tell you straight away that it's either a common red shank or a spotted red shank. Further on in the talk we'll compare both side by side, but the main features you're looking for are um, have a look at the beak. Um, so um, the common red shank has a, a, a thicker stouter beak um, that is black tipped orange to the base um, along with those orange red legs. Fairly un uniform plumage as well, um, so they, I mean they're very well camouflaged. Um, when we compare common and spotted red shank uh, a little bit further on in the talk, um, we'll point out some, some further differences. 
Uh, but it's a species that's worth getting to know quite well. They're quite easy to catch up with at the coast. They're a very common bird. Um, so if you can if you can get confident with red shank and uh, and with Dunlin, um, then you're sort of uh, making good ground in in um, sort of then looking for other scarcer species. I'll just play the call. I'm, I'm hoping this will work. So that's uh, very much the sound of the coast. Um, but yeah, they're, they're probably one of, the, one of the more vocal species um, at the coast that you'll come across. Oh. So next uh, is green shank. Uh, so green shank um, isn't quite so common as, as red shank, um, but it's, it's a bird that you will see frequently. Uh, they tend to hang out on their own. Um, um, they're slightly larger than red shank, uh, but they'll still be classed as a medium sized wader. But yeah, as I say, slightly larger. Um, all uh, white and grey in plumage. Um, if you see one out at a distance in the light, they can almost look bright white at a distance. And there aren't, you know, there aren't that many waders that have that kind of appearance. So if you look, if you see a wader that's, that's reflecting light like, like this, such as a, a, a white and grey light colored wader you know it could it could be a green shank or the other options might be a gray plover uh which is a which is a, a dumpy short build um bird or a, or a sanderling which again is even smaller the size of a dunlin um the other species that can in, in some lights look a little bit similar is spotted red shank but of course a spotted red shank would have the red legs um which would which would point out as a different bird the different species. Um, so green shanks are typically quite nervous and flighty birds. You don't often get the opportunity to get that close to them. Um, they're very wary, a uh, bit like their, their cousins, their, the common red shank. They're, they're flighty, wary, and uh, they call a lot, make a lot of noise. Um, in flight, they're quite distinctive. Um, so as you can see the image in the top left corner, uh, the image of a, of a green shank in flight so they have no wing bars um, and you know that, that these pictures and books all look great but in reality when you're in the fields when, when they're flying what really stands out is that large white wedge of a rump um, so if you see a bird flying away making a lot of noise with the most distinguishing feature is a big patch of white on its back and it's got dark wings without a wing bar that's almost certainly going to be a green shank um, they uh, they continue calling all the time that they're flying, so they're quite easy to follow in a flight to see where they land, just to confirm to confirm that you have indeed got a green shank. Um, but yes, they're great birds to get to know well. Um, the other distinguishing feature, of course, is is it says in the books at least they've got long green legs. But in, again, in reality, when you're out in the field, it depends what light you're in as to how how green those legs look. They can often look grey. They can often look brown. Um, but yes, yeah, they're certainly not quite colored legs, that's for sure. Um, so we've got a, a little clip of song here. So, so Red Shank we played just a second ago, which is quite a distinctive call, but, and then Red Shanks make a lot of noise, but it's not especially far carrying. Uh, whereas Green Shank, um, they generally only call when they're flying uh, or when they're getting shirty with another bird, but um, their noise carries an awful long way. So it can carry maybe 100 meters or so. It's not unusual to be, um, you know, on a, on a different part of, of the marsh and hear a red shank, oh sorry, green shank a long way in the distance. So I'll play their call. So yes, it's worth, worth keeping an ear out for. It's also one, funny enough, I've, I've been lying in bed at night and I've heard green shank fly over the house. It's such a loud call. So there's one, one worth getting to know quite well. And so the next bird uh, to get to know is the grey plover. So um, grey plover is a fantastic bird. Um, it's uh, very, um, an, a very entertaining bird to, to watch. Um, very much a coastal bird. Um, almost always on the coastal, on, on the offshore side of the sea wall. Um, so they'll feed on the intertidal. Um, then they'll roost on offshore islands or on areas of salt marsh. If they're forced off of those, they will reluctantly come over the sea wall and, and roost uh, inland, um, but they don't like to. Um, 
every now and then they'll go probably I, I remember once in on a very very stormy day god knows why i was out i was out in the new forest uh on beauty heath and i came across some gray plovers out there but it was it was horrendous weather so they've just been driven inland but uh, generally they'll always be uh offshore um so the distinguishing features are um they're they're a medium-sized wader again similar size to um the red shanks and the green shanks we we're just talking about but they're shorter legs they're they're dumpier uh i hate saying that i've been saying that a lot about plovers all the way through this it's not very I don't, I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but it's, um, they are kind of more rounded and yeah, than uh, the other species. Uh, they have a short bill um, they have a very distinctive feeding um, uh, as, as with other plovers, um, they feed using their eyes and their ears. Um, so you can, you can watch them offshore. They'll be looking and listening for prey. Um, they'll maybe walk, maybe two or three meters, stop, look and listen either pick up some food or morsel of food or, or move on and sometimes you can actually see them cocking their head uh, to try and hear a bit more and it's, it's, it's fascinating they're actually sort of listening to, to stuff in the mud that they'll, they'll then um, pluck out. You can see they've got very big eyes um, and part of that is because of the life they lead so you know like a lot of a lot of our waders not all of our waders but quite a few will, will live their life by the tide cycle rather than the day night cycle so and grey plovers are, are one of those because they're, they're tied to, to feeding on the exposed areas when, when the tide goes out. So they'll be out day and night just whenever the tide permits. So their life is, is feeding at low tide and, and sleeping at high tide or roosting at high tide. Um, so the other similar species to, to grey plover is golden plover, um, which are very similar in shape and overall general appearance. Um, but they have different habits. So the, the grey plover is very much a coastal bird that will live offshore in salty areas on the intertidal. Whereas you might get golden plover at the coast as well, but they would always be in the more the freshwater kind of areas. So they, they'll live on brackish or freshwater marshes. So their paths, although they can live, like, you know, we get, we get them both at, at Pennington, but they, they won't cross paths all that often because the, the golden plovers will be slightly inland on the fresh marsh, and the, grey plovers will be offshore. Um, if you were to have two side by side it would be perfect and you would see that the grey plover is a much paler bird um, overall um, whereas the, the golden plover is, is entirely dark um, almost in appearance brownish or in the right light sort of golden. Um, when it gets difficult with these birds um, is, is when they're flying but uh, um, it's useful to Look at their armpits. So uh, a grey plover has has black armpits, uh, whereas a golden plover doesn't. Um, so if you see a flock of birds flying, uh, have a look. Have a look at their armpits. Uh, if you think they might be a plover species, because um, that's quite diagnostic. Uh, in general, uh, golden plovers will form big flocks and feed in big flocks and, and live, live their life in the flock, whereas grey plovers don't so much. Um, you know, they're all together offshore, but they're, they're not as what I would call flocking together. They're just there in a group um, doing their own thing individually, whereas golden plovers are very much a flocking bird that live their life um, with one another. Um, so they behave, both behave differently. Um, but yes, they, they, can, they can be a challenge. The other, the other way to distinguish them is by the call. Um, so I'll play the contact call of the grey plover. When grey plovers are feeding offshore, they're constantly calling all the time. And, and you know, for me, uh, it's either Kelly or grey plover are, are the sound of, of the marsh. If, if ever I hear one anywhere, it takes me back to, uh, to Normandy Marsh, to be honest. So this is, this is the call. Okay, and then uh, the other just the other thing to point out about grey plover is when they're in their summer plumage. And so, if if you're fortunate enough to be at the coast when the first migrants come back in 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 August and September, you might be lucky enough to see one in their breeding plumage, such as the one in the bottom bottom right. Um, they look absolutely splendid, um, uh, really beautiful. Um, they quickly molt out of that. So by by late September, October, they they'd be much as, as the bird in, in the central picture. Um, but it's worth getting down to the coast uh, in August to try and have a look for uh, summer plumaged grey plovers. So fantastic. Okay, 
Uh, so next up we have black-tailed godwit, which is another very common coastal species and it's another one that's actually quite difficult to explain because they're brown and drab as well and that seems like a crime saying that about black-tailed godwit. Um, probably really, although they're quite quite drab and uniform in colour, they're probably one of our most beautiful waders, I think, or oh, I might, might be a little bit biased there, but um, they're almost like the perfect wader, sort of long legs, long build, very sleek and elegant um, birds. Um, they spend the winter with us. We have a few that over summer each year, um, but during the winter months, they, such as this bird in the middle is a, is a classic uh, wintering individual. Um, we'll focus in a little while on the difference between black-tailed and bar-tailed godwit. So we won't talk about individual features so much here. It's just about getting to know black-tailed godwit. Um, they're a probe feeder, so they're happy feeding in the water, or they're just as happy feeding um, on uh, intertidal, on exposed mud when the tide goes out. Um, they can form quite large flocks. Um, they're always bickering amongst themselves, having, having little arguments with one another. Um, and they're just as happy offshore as they are either side of the seawall, essentially, uh, wherever the feeding conditions are right. They're fairly nomadic in their, in their movements, so they'll go to wherever the feeding is best. So you know, some years um, in, in my neck of the woods here at Lymington Keyhaven, some years we can have hundreds hanging around, uh, but if it gets too wet or too dry here, or the conditions are better elsewhere, places like the Avon Valley, they will um, upship and, and move off um, and then, then you won't see one from one day to another. Um, so you know, they, they, uh, they do come and go. Um, they're probably one of the more distinctive waders in flight. Um, so that image at the top left is a black-tailed godwit in flight, which almost looks like a stripy zebra sometimes. If you're looking at a flock in the field that are flying past, they can appear very stripy which is sort of contrary to how they look when they're, they're, when they're settled feeding. Um, but yes, they have quite a bold uh, wing bar um, and that white rump um, is, makes them quite distinctive in flight, um, uh, especially when compared to Bartow Godwits that we'll look at in a bit. Um, the other thing to note is like, like with a lot of wading species with long beaks, they have nerve endings in the tip of their beak. So when they're feeding, they can probe quite deep and they can feel feel for uh, the, the food that they're looking for deep in the mud um, and they can actually move the tip of their beak independently so they can grab. So quite often if you're watching a feeding flock you'll see them uh, drilling away in the ground and every now and then one will pull something up and throw it down its throat. Um, that's when it's caught something um, and you know if you, if you if you happen if you're lucky enough to come across a flock that are just just loafing over high tide sitting out high tide on a lagoon somewhere Watch them. If you've got one preening, have, have a watch and eventually it'll, it'll yawn, it'll stretch its mouth out. And when they do that, the tips of their beak bend right back. It can look, um, yeah, mess bizarre. But it, it shows you, you can see where they, how they have the movement in the tip of their beak there. Um, the other thing to mention is in there, as with bar-tailed godwit, in the summer season, breeding plumage is uh, a nice, lovely brick red colour. Um, so they molt in, into that before they leave um, in April and May and often when they come back in August, September, early October, they're still there, they'll molt out of that brick red plumage, uh, which, is, which is beautiful. Um, so yeah, it's great to see them. All our corporates go off to Iceland to breed. Okay, um, so now we're going to start looking at some, some of the more uh, common confusion species. We're going to start off with the hardest one, uh, Dunlin Sandling and Curlew Sandpiper, and then we'll look at a few others. Uh, just as a note, these birds at the bottom of the picture here, these are bar-tailed godwits. So you can see, as I mentioned on the black tail just now, how stripy it looked in flight. The bar-tails are quite different. They've got no wing bar at all, uh, and their rump really doesn't show up um, when they're in flight. And another feature to look for is the upturned uh, beak, ever so slightly upturned. And, you know, it's something that you'd think actually, yeah, that's not a very helpful feature, but it does actually stand out in the field. Um, so, it's, yeah, so that's a flock of bar-tailed godwits. So, <clears throat> Dunlin, Sandling, Curly Sandpiper. So these are three classic small waders that you could get in a flock together. The other, there is a fourth member of this flock that would regularly join it, and that's the ringed plover that we'll look at, I think, next. The ring plover is distinctive enough to sort of remove from this little group. Um, 
So first of all, uh, generally, if you've got a flock of small waders, uh, chances are the dominant species is going to be a dunlin. Um, so that's the reason to get to know dunlin very well, unless you happen to be on a shingle or sandy shore where you might get dunlin and sandling mixed together feeding, um, potentially in equal numbers. Um, so let's look at let's look at dunlin and sandling first of all. Uh, so they're both similar sized birds, similar shape. Um, Overall, the sandaling is a little bit chunkier. Um, if you were to look at the beaks, the sandaling has a slightly chunkier bill uh, than the dunlin, which is, which is fantastic if you happen to have two that will stand there and pose nicely side by side. So you go, oh yes, that one's more slender, but it never works like that in real life. Um, so the things to, things to look out for are really is the plumage is the main thing with these two. So sandaling always have this, this lovely, white grey appearance and um, they really stand out that they're, they're beautifully striking birds. Um, what can sometimes throw a spanner in the works is if you have a juvenile turn up. Um, so bottom right uh, of this slide is a juvenile sandling and uh, so you can see there um, you can still see it's a sandling in that picture because you know it's still got that very white belly, white appearance, it's still got that sort of slightly chunkier beak. Um, you'll note with the dunlin is its beak is slightly down curved whereas the dunlin is pretty uh, sorry the sandaling is is pretty much straight. Um, the other spanner that could be thrown into the works is if you've got an adult uh, breeding plumage the sandaling that might turn up in August or September but again they still have that overall sandaling feel to them um, and that white belly uh, is the thing to look out for so they have a white belly. Now if we look across to the sand to the dunlin that also has a white belly but it's just got an overall darker appearance particularly there's like that, that collar that comes around on the chest it just looks greyer I hate to say drabber uh, in an overall appearance um, and you know in general um, dunlin for pretty large flocks at the coast. Um, they feed They feed slightly differently to sandaling, so, so dunlin will always be stitching away, almost like a sewing machine, stitching away in the mud looking for, for their prey. Um, sandaling always feel a little bit more deliberate in the way that they feed and they'll, they'll move a lot more running when they're feeding on in their classic environment along a, along a shoreline, they'll be running up and down the shoreline. Um, when they get in with a flock of dunlin, uh, so what can happen, you could have maybe, you know, a thousand dunlin with two sandaling in with them. The sandaling tend to behave differently. They don't behave like classic sandaling, but they're still, they're still not like the dunlin. They, they're still sort of more laborious and slow and um, they've got an overall different feel to them. And of course, when you get these white pale birds in with a big flock of dunlin, they really stand out like a sore thumb. So, as I said before, going back to earlier in the talk, you get to know your dunlin really well, and then you'll pick out things like the sandling, and then again, the curly sandpiper. So curly, moving on to curly sandpiper. So if you're looking, uh, you're ne you never get very many curly sandpipers anywhere. Um, I think the largest flock I've had is about 16, um, but yeah, you don't, you, you don't get that many these days. Um, but they will frequently associate themselves with flocks of dunlin. Um, but what you're looking for is, is a much, they're a much slender, sort of more sleeker looking bird, um, long legged, um, a lovely V curved bill, which is longer than, than the Dunlins. Um, so they're slightly taller. Um, so they do stand out when they're in a flock. Um, they do uh, um, look quite different, very elegant, uh, very attractive birds. Um, I said about the black tail godwit being a perfect way, but you can almost argue that the Kitty Sandpiper is as well. I mean, they're, they're wonderful birds. Um, but what does stand out is that scaly, scalloped appearance on, on their back. Um, so if you had a bird in a flock of Dunlin, you, you, you can't just, you, you'd have to pick out all the different features and think first, the first thing is to notice that, that it's different, uh, that identify that it's not a Dunlin, and then start looking at the individual features like the bill, the legs, uh, the plumage overall. And one thing that really does give them away, if, if, if as frequently happens, the flock takes flight because of some unseen threat somewhere, um, the, um, the Kelly sandpipers will stand out because they have a big white rump. Um, so if you see them all flying around, scan through with your binoculars um, and look, look for a bird with a white rump and that will confirm that, that you've most likely got a Kelly sandpiper in there. Uh, whereas a sandaling, um, when they're in flight, they have big broad white wing bars and so they also stand out differently from the dunlins. Um, so you're looking for these little uh, different features. 
Timing is also another thing. So curly sandpipers uh, pass through in, in May and August to October. Um, so look at the time of the year. If you're looking at a flock in December, no, it could still be a curly sandpiper. There is one in, in uh, Chichester Harbour at the moment, but um, you know, that's, that's highly unlikely. But, um, yeah. So let's move on. Uh, that was the hard one done. Let's move on to slightly easier ones. So this is um, ringed plover and little ringed plover. Um, so um, two very similar species. So ringed plover would often associate with a flock of uh, dunlin quite happily. Um, but if you're looking to separate little ringed plover and ringed plover, you're going to be in the summer um, because little ringed plover is a summer visitor that's here from March to September. Um, they don't like going offshore at all, so they're going to be inside the seawall. Um, they could be anywhere in the county, in fact, uh, on a gravel pit, um, but we get them breeding at the coast as well. And that's, that's where they come into contact with ringed plovers and you need to, to separate them at coastal, coastal lagoons. The easy, quick way to, 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 to distinguish uh, little ringed plover is that great big yellow eye ring, and it really does stand out from quite a long way away. Um, the only time your plans could be slightly scuppered by that is if you have a juvenile um, that don't have the orange, but they still have an eye ring, which is a bit more pinky in colour. So look out for that eye ring is quite a good feature. Uh, another one is the beak um, or the bill. Uh, so they have uh, orange, uh, ringed plover has an orange base, black tipped beak. Uh, little ringed plover is all black. And the other thing is going back to what I said before, it's a general impression, size and shape. Um, the little ringed plover is a totally different shape. In this image, it's these pictures here, it's difficult to distinguish, but the little ringed plover is almost very streamlined, very sleek. And it gets that appearance because they're long winged, long tailed birds. Um, so they, they, they've got a lot at their hind quarter. So it makes them look very streamlined and sleek. Whereas a uh, ringed plover is almost quite dumpy in appearance. I'll call him dumpy again. But um, yes, there's, there's quite a few differences. Um, and the other thing, where you get them together, where you get them breeding together at the coast, they can't stand one another. And they, they will often choose to breed on, on the same lagoon, uh, often very close to one another, and they're constantly fighting with one another. They're like having a couple of teenagers around there, forever bickering. Um, and I've, I've spent hours watching them over the years, and they're as bad as each other. They're always having a go at each other. But very entertaining if you get them both from the same place at the coast. So, so I definitely recommend seeking them out. Okay, so uh, the next one I get asked most about is the difference between common and spotted red shank. Um, so we've, we've discussed common red shank already. So there's common red shank on the left. So you can see it's got this sort of chunkier black tipped bill, um, sort of duller overall appearance. Um, so let's look at spotted red shank, which is on the right. So um, the first thing to say is overall spotted red shanks are slightly more elegant, sleek looking birds. And the first thing you probably notice is they're paler. Um, so, and, and especially from a distance, if the sun's on them, they can actually look very pale. Um, and that's largely down to their unmarked pale belly. Um, whereas if you look at the common red shank, they have quite a dark colored belly. Um, so especially in light, that reflects the light quite strongly. Um, the other thing to look at is the beak. Um, so the beak on a spotted red shank is very needle fine, quite long and curved hook tipped at the end. Um, whereas by comparison, the, um, the common red shank is quite thick, almost quite stubby and it hasn't got that hook tip at the end. Um, but then the other feature um, which, um, which stands out is, is around the face there. So you can see, you can see stretching between, between the bill and the eye is that dark line, which is against a pale face. And so that gives it like almost like it's got a, a supercilum, quite a pale supercilum, quite a pale face with that black line. So it gives its head almost like a, yeah, like it's got a supercilum. Um, so a supercilum is like the eye stripe that goes above the eyes. Um, so that's quite, quite, a good, quite a good feature. So what I would do is if, if, if you're out, Get to know your red shanks, your common red shanks very well. And then if you're out and about and you think, oh, that, that, might, be a, that might be a spotted red shank, I would look at just a couple of those features. And if you can, if you can do that, see it's got, a, got the pale belly, got the needle fine bill and that eye stripe. Um, if you could get all those features together, then I would say, yeah, that's, that's going to be a spotted red shank. And you know, spotted red shanks have different feeding habits as well, uh, ever so slightly. They like to feed in often in, in lagoons by swimming in lagoons in a group, a little bit like out of the way avocets do, um, almost herding uh, their prey. 
uh, which would generally be, I mean, what they're, they're, what they're targeting is little tiddler fish, uh, but they will eat uh, little shrimps and all sorts of invertebrate life in the water. But they're, they're, <laughs> their golden goal is to get a little tiddler fish, um, whatever, whatever species it might be. And then when they, when they catch that, one will break off from the group and go and sort of hide in a corner and spend ages eating it trying to get it down its throat. Um, so that's yeah, very entertaining to watch. So gener generally they will be in the lagoons. They like the sheltered areas. They feed with their eyes. So they're, they're, they're looking for food in the water. Um, and so they're almost always in the sheltered bits. Um, so you can guarantee um, you know, places like, uh, if we're talking Lymington, Keyhaven, they'll be on, on Oxy Marsh or Normandy Marsh because those are the the areas that are better protected from the prevailing westerlies that we get. So, so the water's calmer, so it's easier for them to see through and feed in. Um, of course, if the wind changes, they'll move to a different bit of the marsh. Um, so another feature to look at, we'll play, we'll play the uh, common red shank call again, just to familiarise ourselves with it. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's the common red shank, but the spotted red shank is a very distinctive, almost two-tone, high-pitched call, uh, which they so it's spotted red shanks. So common red, sorry, common red shanks are vocal pretty much all the time. Um, spotted red shanks generally only call when they're in flight, so when they're commuting from one area to another in flight. They, otherwise, they generally remain silent. Uh, but this is the this is the call that you you would hear. So it's a completely different call, uh, quite a far carrying call. It carries quite a long way, that call. Um, so it's worth, worth getting to know that. Um, and then just finally, a, a point on breeding plumage. So the, the spotted red shank goes into it's this beautiful, uh, absolutely fantastic, all black plumage uh, in the breeding season. Uh, they start to molt into that from late April, uh, completing it sort of about mid-May sort of time. It takes about three or four weeks for them to molt into that colour. Um, and yeah, most years we're fortunate enough to have some that hang on to, to uh, molt into that colour before they depart in mid-May. Um, so it's always worth having a look out for them. Whereas a common red shank, they do they do um, they do molt as well, but they get they don't change in such a drastic way. So they get quite a lot more of a, a, a speckledy appearance on their on their breast, um, and they develop quite a white, quite a bold white eye ring. Um, but yes, yeah. so that's, um, I'm just conscious of the time, so we'll move on. Um, so that's common and spotted red shanks. So next is another challenge one is uh, black and bartel godwits. That's another one I get asked a lot about, but actually they're, they're um, not, not as challenging as common and spotted red shanks, I would say. So we've talked about black tail godwit already. So it's black tail godwit on the left, um, which is, as I said before, fairly drab, uniform in colour um, overall. Bartel Godwit on the right. So the main, you, know, you can look in the books and it will tell you all sorts of different things to, to look out for. But for me, when I'm out in the field, the thing that's most striking and easy to see is just, just the streaking appearance on the back. So if you look at the Blacktail Godwit there, it's got a very, very streaky appearance. Um, whereas comparing it to the, to the Blacktail Godwit, it's all universal, um, sort of drab, uniform colour. So that's, that's a quick and easy way to distinguish between Black and Bartel Godwit. Um, once you've got that, you, you can look at other features. So there's there's the bill, um, which in a Bartel Godwit is ever so slightly upturned, um, and that does actually stand out in the field. Um, Bartel Godwits are shorter legged, slightly smaller, but of course, you know, like I said before, unless you have two posing perfectly side by side, you're not going to really pick that up in the field. Um, then the other thing is in flight. Um, uh, as, as their name suggests, you can see the, the black tail godwit has the black tail and the bar tail godwit has the barred tail. But really, I wouldn't lose myself in trying to pick out those features in flying godwits. So if you see some birds out and about them, one thing, you, the first thing you need to do is just identify them as godwits. Um, and to identify a bird as a godwit is going to be a large wader, not far off um, a curly sort of size bird. Um, they're, they're a fair bit smaller, but they're, they're a big wader on log leg, long legs. But they've got a straight bill. So a curly or a wimble will always have a curved bill. So if you've got that, then you've, you've almost certainly got a godwit. So once you've identified you've got a godwit, then look at those individual features, look at the, the back, uh, whether you've got streaking on the back or whether it's uniform. Um, 
if they're flying past, it's even easier. So if they're flying, the godwit will have the so the black tail godwit will have the white wing bars and the white rump with the black tail, whereas the bar tail godwit has no wing bars um, and the barred tail. And because you've got because you're moving from a from a, from the sort of uh, the 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 barred uh, wings, as it were, to the barred tail, they, they, that white rump doesn't stand out nowhere anywhere near as much as it does on the black tail godwit. In summer plumage, we'll just touch on that very quickly. They both go into this beautiful brick red plumage. Uh, in general, the bar tail godwit is much more uh, overall red, whereas the black tail godwit has, yeah, has more of a blackish appearance on the back and sort of white on the flanks. Um, the, um, the other thing to note is that bar tail godwit is pretty much a, um, a coastal bird, so they'll always generally be offshore. Uh, feeding on the intertidal and then roosting on islands or salt marsh areas, whereas the black-tailed godwits are uh, much more nomadic in their nature. They're happy to go back and forth and around and about. Every now and then you might get a, black, a bar tail godwit cotton onto a flock of black-tailed godwits and then, then that will move inland with them, but generally you wouldn't get bar tail godwits going on the landward side of a seawall. Okay, so curlew and wimbrel. Um, so curlew is a is a distinctive a distinctive species that I'm, I'm sure we're all probably um, comfortable with. It's our largest wader uh, with a with a very large uh, down curved uh, bill, um, long legged, tall, beautiful species. Um, they're with us year round. They breed in the New Forest. We have about forty pairs uh, winter on our coasts. And they like to feed offshore or inland. Um, so, and then conversely, looking at wimbrel. So, wimbrel is a is a migrant. So that's passing through in May, um, and then again in September and October, going uh, each way. Um, they're much more coastal species, although they can be encountered anywhere in the county um, as they as they're passing over. Um, but it's worth noting if you're looking at a bird and you're not sure it's worth noting the time of year because um, as I say curly year round wimbles quite seasonal. Um, wimbles are an awful lot shorter, uh, smaller sorry they're, they're quite a bit smaller um, but again it's one of those unless you've got them side by side it's difficult to say um, but some of the features to look out for if you've got a bird and you're not sure you know you're sort of sitting on the fence you're not sure curly or wimble some of the easy features to look out for are the head uh, on a wimbrel is quite stripy, essentially. So they've got a central crown stripe, which you can't really see in this image, but they've got a central crown stripe over the top of their head. And then they've got a, what appears to be like a supercilum over the top of their eyes, another white stripe. So it makes the head look quite stripy when you look at them. Their bill as well is also shorter, stubbier and thicker um, than a curlew. Um, and it, it has more of a pronounced, so it, it, it has more of a pronounced curve on it, whereas um, a curly is more of a, 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 of a gentle curve. The thing to be aware of is a juvenile curly. If you're at the coast in August, say, uh, juvenile curlies can appear a bit stripy, but they're, um, um, the, the wimbles are quite distinctive. Um, one thing, uh, we'll, we'll play a couple of calls. So this is the curly call. Um, very evocative call. That's a far carrying call, uh, but the, the wimble is a completely different type of call that is it, tremendously far carrying, uh, carries a long way. They, they give the call generally only when they're in flight. I'll, I'll play, it, play it now. So they'll, they'll give that call while they're flying uh, and that can carry a huge distance. So I've, I've been watching wimbrels, at, well, I mean, I've been at the coast and I've heard wimbrels and scanned everywhere for them. And I found them because I heard the call uh, way off over, near, over the other side of the, um, of the Solent, sort of two or three kilometres away. And you can pick up that call. So it's, it carries tremendously well. So it's worth getting to know that, that distinctive um, wimbrel call. Um, and then you know they pass over Hampshire, so I've I've had them in all over the New Forest, never on the ground, but just just flying over. Um, so it's it's a good one to get to know. Okay.
Uh, and then we'll look at some common passage migrants. So these are birds that will pass through in the autumn. So this is a little Stinton curly sandpiper. We've, we've covered curly sandpiper fairly well before when we were talking about Dunlin. So we'll talk a little bit about little stint. So little stint is, is a tiny little wader. So we say, we're saying a, a, a Dunlin is, is a bit smaller than a, than a starling or like a big finch. Well, a, a little stint is, is sort of sparrow sized sort of bird. Uh, they're, they're, they're very small. Um, so that's the main distinctive feature in itself is that you've got a very small wader. Uh, they tend to hang out uh, when they're here, they'd hang out with a flock of Dunlin or, or um, generally, or they'd be feeding on their own. They're, it's almost like they've, uh, they've OD'd on coffee or something because they go at hyper speed. You think, you think Dunlins go fast, but, but little stints are constantly on the move constantly drilling for food. Um, they're one of those birds that you can be looking at, look away and look back again and they've just, you've just lost them because they've lost them to the flock. Um, for, for a bird that stands out, they can be lost in the flock of Dunling quite easily. Um, so, I mean, the first noticeable feature is that they're quite small, but quite often with me, when I, I think it's, it's, they stand out because they're quite light coloured. And this picture doesn't do it justice as often photographs don't, but if you've got a little stint in a flock of Dunlin, say they, that white belly, they, they really stand out as being a paler bird. And they have that distinctive rufous coloured um, back and crown on their head. Uh, this is a juvenile little stint. The majority of the birds that we get come through are juvenile little stints. Um, and then the other thing to distinguish it from one of the rarer, say American waders or tenex stints or whatever, is that they have these stripes. They have a couple of stripes, like dungaree stripes down their back. And you can see a hint of it on one side of this bird. So it's a white stripe that runs down either side of its back. Um, so if you've got a small bird in the flock and you're not sure, look out for that feature. And if you could combine that with a rufous appearance, rufous crown, quite pale, very small, then yeah, that's safe to say you've got a little stint there. Um, and now, so we'll look at these, these other common passage migrants. Uh, these, are, these are trickier um, just because they're all fairly, nondescript. Um, so we've got common sandpiper, wood sandpiper and green sandpiper. So uh, common sandpiper and green sandpiper are the commonest of the two. Uh, they both appear in numbers on passage uh, but both will stay in winter in, in the county. Both can turn up pretty much anywhere. Um, they're more numerous at the coast in the autumn when they're passing through but you might get easily get or you almost certainly will get common and green sandpipers at gravel pits up and down the county and along waterways. In particular, common sandpipers along waterways, um, they can turn up anywhere. Um, so the distinctive feature about these sandpipers is the way that they feed. So they have all have a very distinctive bobbing action where they dip up and down, or dipping their tail. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen a dipper, but it's kind of, I guess, fairly similar to that or how a jack snipe might feed. Um, so the first thing is to, to identify that you've got one of these uh, one of these sandpipers and then to, to look at it in more detail as to how to identify it. Um, we do call separately, so that's, they all have distinctive calls. Um, but the commonest of the three is the common sandpiper and generally the easiest way to identify that. There's, there's two things I find. There's, there's the, uh, in the plumage, you've got this white stripe. You can just see it on this image of the bird. There's, a, there's a, a white reaching up in front of its wings, in between its chest and its wings, it's got this white that's leading up towards its the back of its neck. So that's quite a distinctive feature because neither, neither the wood sandpiper nor the green sandpiper have that. So if your bird that you have is dipping, uh, it's quite a small wader uh, feeding generally on its own at the water's edge and it's got that white stripe, you can be fairly safe to say you've probably got a common sandpiper there. Whereas the other common species or a slightly common species is the green sandpiper. So the green sandpiper by comparison to the common sandpiper is slightly larger, not by a huge amount. It doesn't have that white stripe and it's an overall a kind of darker bird. Um, they still have the similar uh, feeding motion um, and um, they have, uh, they're quite, dark wings um, which, which do stand out. Um, they're very flighty, very nervous uh, birds. Um, but the thing is with these is to get to know, to, 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 to look at the, the plumage, the features, but then also get to know the flight call because that was quite distinctive. 
Um, uh, another, so the, th the third one we have here is the wood sandpiper, uh, which, is, which is the scarcer of the three, it's, it's quite a scarce species uh, generally, very nervous bird. Um, um, it feeds in a similar way, um, but it, um, it stands out from the other three as being slightly easier to identify because it has that very pale supercilum, so that, that line above the eye. Um, and overall, now this picture doesn't do it justice, but overall on its back in seeing one in the flesh, they're quite spangly in appearance. Um, so they've got a lot of white, um, white in their plumage across their back that makes them look like really sort of stand out. They're a much more attractive species, dare I say, than the other two. Um, all three are quite nervous. So what we do, we'll play their flight course. So this is, this is the common sandpiper, first of all. And it's worth saying here as well, the, the, the common sandpiper will give that call, all three of these birds will give that call when they're flying generally, they're quite silent when they're landed, but they, the common sandpiper in particular has quite a distinctive flight. Um, it, it almost sort of flutters its wings and flies low, very low over the water. Um, um, so it's, yeah, it's got quite a distinctive, almost quite weak looking flight. Um, so we'll go on next to the green sandpiper, which is uh, the other uh, fairly common one. And that's fairly appropriate, that call, because that's obviously flying away. And that's generally how I hear mine or see mine. Uh, they're very nervous birds. So uh, if you're in anywhere in an open habitat, they'll see you before you see them and you'll just hear them flying away from you generally. Uh, in my experience, unless you happen to be in a hide, um, that'll be how you experience them. Um, but then we'll go on third to the wood sandpiper, which also has a distinctive call. Okay, but I wouldn't get too hung up on any of these. Um, um, the, it's, if, if you want to get to grips with any of them, I'd get to grips with the common sandpiper is the one to, to learn very well and that will help you work on the other two. Oh. Um, before we move on, what I should say, well, we're going to move on to other, bit of other features, but what I would just say as well, just about learning, identifying waders is, you know, um, I wouldn't get too hung up on, on um, clinching everything uh, straight away. The main thing I think is, as I said before, is learn, learn your Dunlin, your Red Shank, your Black Tail Godwit, maybe your Curlew. Uh, get to know those really well, but don't put yourself under pressure to learn everything all straight away. We've, we've gone through a lot tonight, um, and there's a lot of calls and a lot of identification features, and it's, and it's an awful lot to take in. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too hung up and you know mastering it all straight away just the main thing is in enjoying enjoying birds for what they are just go out and enjoy them watch them and it will all start to click into place especially if you start to you know you get to know your dunlins get to know your red shanks and then it'll all all click together but the main thing i think is i see a lot of people out that are almost not enjoying what they're doing because they're stressing about getting their identification right you know and of course it's important to get your identification right in some circumstances but really the main thing is to enjoy it and let it let it come at its own time and don't don't rush yourself into it anyway going off track there so um so just a quick bit about breeding waders in hampshire I'm just conscious that we're we're now over running um so i mean you can read that for yourself on the right there the estimated number of pairs uh in hampshire of our the birds that we have um there's some notable ones there um such as lapwing which is hugely hugely declined um, curlew also massively declined. Um, there's some going the other way, like Avocet is doing quite well. Um, ringed plover is another species we're concerned about. But then we've got species like snipe, uh, which have um, always been a very challenging bird to um, survey. But there was a survey this year um, in that, that covered snipe in quite some detail and found 150 pairs of snipe in the new forest, which is fantastic, which is more than we thought we would have. So, you know, it's a mixed bag for waders, but waders have a tough life. They have a, have a tough existence. Um, and, you know, trying to try and being a wader, a ground, a ground nesting bird of any sort, trying to, to be successful in a county like Hampshire, which is, which is sort of bursting at the seams with people, it's going to be tough. And so, you know, in general, waders, um, just as a sort of, yeah, in, in, in general, their, their breeding um, uh, season 
Um, they all nest on the ground. Uh, they all will nest in a, in a fairly shallow scrape. Um, most of them are on the nest from April to June. They all have fairly small clutches. Most of them are very site faithful. Um, uh, so they'll return to the same places to breed year after year, um, which makes them very vulnerable to um, development. Because um, you know if they, they, they they've waders are site faithful to feeding sites. They're very very territorial. We've had for G GPS tracking that you know, they they have their their feeding sites and, and that's it. They you know there's so much competition, and it's the same with breeding. They're they're very site faithful. And so if you know if an area gets developed or or, or its use changes, that can be uh, um, disastrous for our waders and they're also hugely vulnerable to predation and disturbance as I say so um, waders make fantastic parents and I'd recommend anybody to go and watch them breeding you somewhere uh, such as at the coast at Farlington Marshes or Titchfield or Lymington Keyhaven here you, you can watch them in relative comfort from the sea wall at a distance so you're not disturbing them and they make fantastic parents once the young hatch they're, they're mobile almost straight away and the parents, species like Avocet and oyster catcher that we see here, they'll defend them to the hilt. I, I've seen, I've seen Avocets going after uh, marsh harriers and ospreys and buzzards, great blackback gulls, and seeing them off. Um, but the trouble is, while they're off seeing something off, or if there's a dog that's disturbing them, then these things come in and get them. So it's yeah, it's a tough life that they have. So um, we just, I just uh, yeah, sorry, I'm getting on my soapbox, so I'll move on. Um, so breeding waders in Hampshire, so you can find waders breeding pretty much anywhere in the county. So obviously uh, there's a large concentration concentration at the coast uh, where you might find Avocet, that ring, most to catch a ring plover, red shank. Um, gravel pits up and down the county uh, could hold little ring plover or maybe um, lapwing. Freshwater mires and marshes such as we have in the New Forest hold snipe um, hidden away there. That, um, and then heathland mires or wet heathland um, can have curly lapwing. If you're lucky, there's still a couple of pairs of red shank hanging on. Even in thick woodland, you get woodcock uh, breeding, and then farmland, downland, lapwing, and stone curly. So they can be found um, all over the county. You, you don't just have to go to the coast to enjoy waders. Uh, I'll just go through this very quickly, but just to, just a bit to sort of give an example of how how multinational our waders are. So you've got species that we've been, talk, been talking about tonight, Bartel godwits. You know, they're they're going off to breed in um, Arctic Scandinavia and Siberia. They're birds that are wintering here in in the UK. Blacktail godwits. All of our blacktail godwits are going the opposite way. They're going up to Iceland. Curly sandpipers are literally just passing through to refuel uh, before they move on. They're on their way from Siberia to Africa. They've got a massive journey. Um, Grey plovers are uh, breeding up in Arctic Russia. Little ring plovers breed here and then they go off to spend the winter in, in uh, Central Africa. Spotted red shanks are up in Arctic Europe and then coming down here to, to spend the winter. Um, stone curlies that can be breeding here in the UK uh, then move um, move south down to Central and South Africa. Wimbrels, again, a very long range migrant that's just passing through en route from um, Northern Europe to Central Africa. And again, they're just stopping to refuel. Woodcock, uh, it's only recently we've discovered that woodcock can move, move huge distances. So woodcocks that have been ringed in the New Forest in the winter, uh, a colleague of mine uh, had one that was shot, unfortunately, by some, some Russian hunting party. 5,500 kilometers away. It's staggering that, um, that they can move so far. Um, with sandpiper, again, Arctic regions down to southern Europe. So it just go, it goes to show, you know, these birds were moving all the time. We we're just lucky to have them passing through our neck of the woods. So just a quick bit on colour ringed birds. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of birds are colour ringed. Um, the reason we do that is to try and get a better understanding of where birds are moving to and from, um, how long they survive, uh, where their feeding and breeding preferences are. So a whole wealth of information can be gained from that. So it, it can be quite confusing when you see a colour ringed bird in the field. So what I do, I simply, when I see one, uh, as you can see here, I just draw a little cross in my book. Uh, one denoting, one side denoting the left leg, one side denoting the right leg. The line, the uh, horizontal line is the knees. Um, so here you've got one that's got on its left leg, yellow on the upper half, red on the lower, red and black on the right, upper and metal on the lower. And so that's all you need to do. Uh, I mean, that's what I do. Everybody has their own methods. Um, 
I also try and get a photograph if I can, um, just to uh, confirm, because you know there's nothing clearer than a photograph. Um, and then there's various websites you can contact um, or to look at, colouring birding or euring or two. Uh, they're the two I'd recommend. Uh, but you know, I, I won't deny it, it can be a minefield to trying to find a colouring project. So I would, if you know a ringer, I would just contact a ringer and let them do all the work because um, they'd be happy to. Um, now, as it happens, I, I am a ringer and my details are on the HOSS website. So if you find a colouring birdie, you don't know what to do with it, do just let me know. And um, it's, you know, rather than go to all the faff of trying to find out, it can be quite soul destroying looking at all the different websites. Just send me an email and, and I'll be happy to pass it on to whoever ringed it. Uh, if you do find a ring bird, as well as the, the details, it's also helpful to note the date and the time and the location that you recorded it. And then other little details. So if you had a black tail godwit, such as this one, you know, if it was in a, in, a, in a flock of 50 or 100 or 200, whatever the flock size was, it's also, it doesn't have to be exact, but just details like that are always useful. Okay, a couple of examples. And apologies if you saw my last talk about uh, patch birding, but this is repeated here. So this is, this is quite a staggering recovery. Um, this goes to show the value. So this is a little stint, um, which, for whatever mad reason they decided to put a, 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 a colour Darvik ring on SEX. Um, certainly makes it memorable, I suppose. Um, so this bird I had at Normandy Marsh uh, in September 2014. Uh, I contacted the ring. It turned out it was ringed uh, only four days previously, but in northern Norway. So it's flown 997 kilometres in four days. And it spent a few days at Normandy and then it was off on its way south again. So it just goes this tiny, tiny little bird, as you can see, and how, how the distances they cover, staggering. And then the other one here is an Avocet that we colour ringed at Needs Ore uh, in 2015. And it just goes to show a bit of a history of ours. So this, this bird has come back and bred uh, most years. It's still breeding, it's still going strong, uh, AC. Uh, so my data is a bit out of date here, but it's goes to show how they move around. So this has been in Ditchfield Haven, Port Harbour, Newport Wetlands, Slimbridge. Um, so yeah, they get around. Um, so just a bit further reading books I'd recommend. Uh, the way this book is brilliant. Um, so that, that gives a lot of information about not just identification, but how birds move and feed and what they do. So that's a great book. Collins Bird Guide, of course. For birds, but you can't go wrong also with the Hampshire Bird Atlas is great to get details of what's going on in our own county. That's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for overrunning yet again. Marcus, Marcus, thanks indeed. A fascinating insight. Hopefully, uh, I'm, well, hopefully, I know we've all got uh, some great tips from tonight's talk. I really appreciate that. And uh, we can all go out with uh, far more educated as we go yeah. out bird watching uh, over the coming weeks and months and into next year. Um, I we've got one or two questions coming. What well, I might try and just try and capture them, given the time, uh, if that's okay. Uh, I will capture them and I'll feed them on to you. Uh, and perhaps you've got a chance to uh, respond directly to those asking the questions, Marcus. If you're okay with that, um, sure. given the given the time. So I I got to say, as always, thanks to everyone for participating and staying with us tonight. You've held on to pretty much everyone. Only a few have managed that to drop off, uh, Marcus. Thanks again for tonight's talk and obviously your your your, your, your former one the other week. Um, suffice to say, I wish everyone uh, good health. Um, I'd like to say have a Merry Christmas, I'm sure, for everyone. We're not quite going to celebrate it in the way we would ordinarily do so. But uh, however you uh, seek to go through or, or choose to go through Christmas, Christmas I do uh, wish you well. Uh, try and enjoy it uh, within whatever bubble format you decide upon. And we look forward to catching up again in the new year. Where, as I say, we're aiming for one on the 6th of January. Um, info to follow very shortly. So, Marcus, thanks again and good night to everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Barry.